exchanged a jar of blue sand for an ugly nursery of science in here after three decades of studying a copy of the Te Alejo of the Sessions of the Realms of the Dead, how to communicate with it, and what waited for us once we made that journey ourselves. The ingredients were easy enough for us to come by. A lock of hair from a virgin, nobly given by a blushing Dorothy. The placenta of a stillborn child, stolen by aspiring midwife Harriet from a fatally difficult birth she shadowed. And the, um, seed of a bastard, donated by Chris with very little prompting whatsoever. As I was on a pathology residency, it was my job to get the adipose here. Oh, sorry. If you're not familiar with the technical terminology of morgues, forensics, or pathology, you're probably confused. Corpse wax. I had to get the corpse wax. Luckily for me, the perfect John Doe rolled onto the slab only two days after Harriet managed to swipe the placenta. This meant we didn't have to freeze it too long, which was a huge relief. We'd been expecting a wait of a few months at least. That's a long time to carry around the anxiety of Dorothy's Mormon boyfriend accidentally discovering a human placenta in the freezer of his devout fiancé's student accommodation. Kicking things off only a week after Chris found the book was a much appreciated win. I could have kissed the bloated mystery man on the wheeled gurney. The cops had picked him up in the swamps about 10 miles off the interstate after getting a call from some distraught kids dicking around in the hydrofoil. Fully naked when they found him. No ID. One of those unfortunate forgotten folk who walks out into the damp humid bogs to quietly shuffle out of life. His timing couldn't have been better. Adipocere, or corpse wax, happens in certain conditions instead of putrefaction. Basically, if you die somewhere hot and moist enough, the fats in your body undergo a process called anaerobic bacterial hydrolysis. A hard, gray-white wax forms on your skin as the decomposing fat bubbles to the surface and solidifies. It could take months out in the desert, but here in Florida, with the marshes and equatorial sun, decent corpse wax deposits can form on a body just after a few days out there with the reeds and the gators. John Doe had been out there about three months, plenty of time to make a swollen gray body fertile ground for what I had to harvest. I managed to fill three sandwich baggies with the waxy white substance I scraped off his belly with a bread knife. I had to stop when Dr. Bromfield came back to start the post-mortem proper after about 20 minutes. Didn't matter. I had enough. Luckily, my thin-faced professor didn't notice the missing chunks of hard wax on John Doe's swamp water-filled guts. Aside from an earful for not making any admission notes, the rest of our time with the corpse was uneventful. I didn't exhale until I'd firmly shut the door to our apartment behind me, though. Did you get it? Chris took me in his arms, the devilishly handsome grin that made my knees want to buckle plastered on his face. When I nodded, he picked me up and kissed me. It was the same kind of kiss he'd planted after I agreed to make us official. That kind of nostalgia was enough to assuage any of the growing unease I was feeling about the three baggies of decomposed human fat hidden in my satchel. Babe. He said, winking at me. You're the absolute best. I'm gonna go have another read of that book. Is Harriet ready? I looked over my shoulder as I hanged my coat next to the front door. Chris was nodding, already heading up to the stairs to his room. Yeah, she's been buried in candle-making videos on YouTube ever since you text. The other thing should be defrosted now, too. The placenta, you mean? I asked, eyebrows raised. Yeah, that. It still amazes me that of everything the recipe in that old book had us working with, it was the placenta and the aftermath of childbirth that had Chris icked out the most. The knowledge of what Harriet and I were about to do with the wax script from a dead man's belly disturbed him much less than the video she and I had forced him to watch of the birthing process. Honestly, how did that boy reach age 23 before learning what a placenta was? I sure knew how to pick them. Harriet already had a boiling pot of water ready when I dumped the sandwich baggies on the kitchen counter. Jesus, Bex, you got it? I got it. She gave me a half smile, a watery look in her eyes that told me all I needed to know about how much this meant to her. I'd long given up telling her to stop feeling guilty. What are friends for? Besides, even if I didn't want to be involved, 
It was my idiot boyfriend who found that damn book. Everything that happened after he thrust it into her trembling hands was my responsibility, whether I liked it or not. We made idle chit-chat while we worked. I emptied the contents of the sandwich baggies into a pot, then lowered said pot into Harriet's boiling one on the stove. Before long, the stolen fragments of John Doe's waxen crust were bubbling and simmering. Within a few minutes, the kitchen was filled with a sticky, rancid miasma, nauseatingly sweet-smelling steam that oozed from the sludgifying molten corpse wax in the cast iron pot. Good heavens, Chris told me you got some, but I didn't believe. Can we at least open a window? Dorothy was pinching her nose with a dainty hand. In the other, she held a thick braid of hair, the shade of which matched her mousy locks. I did everything just like the instructions Chris gave me. A seven-strand plate. This better work, Katie. I gave up a lot of hair for this. She pointed at her new pixie bob. I did feel for her. If it wasn't for Chris's smooth talking a few months prior, it could have been my hair scooped up from the kitchen floor that morning. Thanks, Dor. Harriet placed a hand on Dorothy's shoulder a tear falling down her cheek. I mean it, really. Okay, ladies, that's enough mushy-mushy stuff. We've got a candle to make. My two housemaids swallowed, Harriet to hold down tears, Dorothy to try and forget what was still bubbling away on the stove. The book was a few hundred years old by the looks of the weathering on the leather sleeve. I'm glad that blenders have been invented since then. Grinding up the placenta in a mortar and pestle as the book suggested would have been one step too visceral for all of us, I think. Thankfully, the $59.99 margarita blender I'd picked up from Walmart had the stolen meat reduced to a dark purple-gray paste in a few seconds. Thank God for engineers with alcohol problems, I muttered to myself as I upended the placental smoothie into the waxen broth. The steam oozing from it turned dark yellow in color the second the liquid afterbirth touched the stew of decomposing fat. We all took this as a sign we were on the right track. The words on those worn pages Chris had found nestled between two volumes on global burial customs were proving true. The stink of the miasma grew intensely. All three of us found ourselves putting on our face masks to try and combat the putrid stench. I never thought I'd find myself being glad about COVID-19. But if it weren't for the pandemic, we wouldn't have had such fit-for-purpose headgear just laying around. Our apartment was by a busy road. The usual horns and tire screeches were drowned out by the hiss of steam, the pop-pop-popping of coagulated human fat. After a minute or so, the three of us found ourselves half-shouting to be heard over the whistling and spitting coming from the stove. The smell and yellow gas managed to summon Chris from our room upstairs. He didn't say a word to us until after he upended the bird's skull containing his, how shall I put this, baby gravy, into the purplish-white slime simmering on the ring of blue flames. The book mentioned nothing about the smell. He waved the small black leather volume, his attempts to fan away the jaundice steam completely futile. Jesus, that fucking reeks. Please tell me we're nearly done. Please don't take the Lord's name in vain, Christopher. But yes, we are. The brow above Dorothy's white fabric mask shot my boyfriend a disapproving look. The same exact one they'd given him two days after Ricky's accident, when he introduced the book into our lives. I have to hand it to Dor. She knew that book was bad news from the start. It's a shame her conviction in her faith mattered much less than the movies make out. I wasn't sure what denomination of Bible thumper Dorothy belonged to. I know she wasn't a Mormon like her, as she called him, sweetheart. Whichever breed of teaching dictated her childhood. However, it was one that involved a lot of homely skills. When she'd said she'd made candles before, she wasn't kidding. It took us just a few hours to clear the mustard steam from the kitchen. We couldn't get rid of the putrid reek that came with it though. That sickly sweet musk is still burning my nostrils even now. It got to the damn carpet and curtains. The landlord will probably have bigger concerns but I guarantee getting that smell out is going to be a pain in the ass if he ever finds new tenants. That's a big if, though. When we all finally sat down that evening, it was with a large, long, gray-purple candle. It looked like the kind of beeswax candles Honey Farm sell on the side in their gift shop. I squeezed Dora's shoulder. We all heard her through the walls, and that was a long time for anyone to spend crying in the shower. Thanks, 
Harriet said again, smiling meekly at her when Dorothy placed a lumpy wax candle with a wick of her own hair on the center of the table. Don't mention it, Hattie. Please. I mean that. Never mention it. Dorothy's gaze didn't leave the column of hair after birth in my boyfriend's genetic material that her delicate, pious hands had sculpted. She swallowed again, and I was genuinely touched by realizing just how far out of her comfort zone she was willing to go to help a grieving friend. Right, ladies, Chris winked at me again. Shall we get started? Harriet squirmed in her seat, her eyes darting around the three of us in the dark around the old wooden table which came with our barely pre-furnished apartment. Don't we need to hold hands, or do an incantation or something like that? Chris shook his head. Nope. According to the book, all we need to do is turn out the lights, and after we've declared our intent, light the candle. Declared our intent? My eyebrows had raised again. I'd never heard Chris sound so... professional before. It wasn't something I knew I found attractive, but I could have leapt over the table and taken him there. My half-serious fuckboy interest was turning into a charge-taking voodoo man right before my eyes, and I was here for it. It's a shame I'll never get to explore that epiphany about my fantasies further. For his part, my boyfriend winked at me again. That's right, babe. By making this thing, we've already weakened the barriers around our world. Before we light it, we've got to declare our reasons for trying to fully reach through them. But once we do, I can speak to Ricky, right? He'll be there. Harriet had grabbed Chris's hands, her eyes streaming and bottom lip beset with violent trembles. I think he caught my jealous glare because he placed her hands gently on the table. Yes. According to this, that's what will happen. He tapped a downturned thumb on the black leather. We followed all the steps. Now we've just got to turn out the lights, let the other side know why we intend to pierce the barrier, and then hey, presto. We can all apologize to Ricky for letting him drive drunk when we were all too cheap to pay for an Uber. The slight crack in his words was enough for me to know his joke was hiding the same intense guilt we all felt. Well, all of us apart from the tea total and at home studying at night Dorothy. I squeezed his knee under the table. Harriet let out a small noise somewhere between a sob and a yelp, but didn't say anything. Despite the callousness of his tone, she knew there was nothing false about Chris's statement. So then... Now we all know what's got to go down, he said, blinking away tears and treating my housemates to the roguish grin usually reserved only for me. Shall we get started? He held the book in one hand, with the other he reached out behind him. There was a click, then a small desk lamp which offered our only protection from the pitch blackness went out. That's the first moment I had the consciousness thought that I'd made a mistake by allowing Chris and Harriet to get so taken with the damn book. I should have listened to Dorothy and thrown it in the trash the instant we saw those grizzled illustrations of flayed bodies and twisted creatures, all sketched with far too much realism to have been generated by imagination alone. Chris said he'd found it in between two books on the Tibetan burial customs. Ricky was a Buddhist, so my idiotic but clearly kind-hearted when it counts boyfriend wanted to read up and see if there was anything we could do to honor Ricky's spirituality because the deceased Baptist parents clearly wouldn't entertain any reference to Ricky's heathen fad. If you're wondering why Chris didn't just use the internet, the answer is simple. He'd literally never used it for anything outside of porn. Social media he accessed through his phone, which he informed me was an app, not the internet. As I said, I know how to pick them. All three of us girls had thought Chris's library digging was a genuinely thoughtful and adorable touch that our lives needed. Bex's stupid boyfriend does something useful for once, at the moment when it actually really counts, was definitely one of the few positive moments in the Ricky accident saga. However, only Harriet kept feeling as such when he showed us the book. It had no writing on the cover. It was sleeved in gnarled dry leather than was the charcoal black of burned flesh. The words on the thing's pages within were inked in an old English dialect which I didn't recognize. Dorothy said it reminded her of her grandfather's old Bibles, the ones he had passed down from his grandfather. It was an edition written by and for the original pilgrims that set sail from England a long, long while before the American Standard Bible was written and distributed in the 1910s. However, it only reminded Dorothy of this family heirloom. There were some words even she didn't recognize. That was enough for her to instantly distrust the rites and incantations laid out in this mysterious, artless tome. 
It had a title though, written by hand on the first page in an unsettling red shade of ink. The Te Alem Araju Alakir. It means teachings of the last man, or that's the closest translation. Harriet had informed us after running the spidery letters through a translation app. It's Arabic, although not written in the Arabic alphabet. She wiped a tear from her eye as Chris then explained the chapter which led us to be sat around that ancient oak table. I should have listened to Dorothy when she took me to the kitchen to beg me to tell my boyfriend no, to convince our housemates that a seance wasn't the way to cope with grief. At least, that was why I thought Dorothy didn't like the idea. I didn't think she actually believed it, despite her frantic wailing about demons and ghosts and spirits and other corn country churchgoer boogeymen. The moment the amber glow of the desk lamp vanished, I knew I should have taken her words at face value. When the light left our apartment, all other sensory reassurances left with it. The humming and honking of the roads which snugly nestled the unit containing our run-down three-bedroom living space vanished. The zesty scent of lemon cleaner Harriet had doused the place in to mask that putrid musk withdrew from my nostrils, leaving only the nausea of the sticky candle-making miasma baked into every fiber of fabric in the room. The usual faint amber and neon glow from the narrow gaps between curtain and wall were gone. The reeking pitch darkness was cold and moist, far colder and moister than Florida evenings have any business being. I could hear Dorothy whimpering in the dark, praying to herself under her breath. Harriet's breath was slow and steady, but I heard the occasional sniffing in the gloom from her sucking back tears. Chris's breaths came through shallow and excited. After a lifetime of being that useless kid who caused problems, he was relishing his time as a man that fixed them. For those in the darkness listening, he said, his voice level and measured despite his excitement, we four have constructed the Minerid Aruya. God, I hope you're pronouncing that right, I muttered, joking in an attempt to calm my nerves. Chris continued, though not without giving me a sharp but playful kick under the table. We have gathered the ingredients as instructed in the Te'alim al-Raju al-Akir. We are declaring our intent to you now, as laid out in the teacherless teachings. We declare the air we breathe open to the Aulaic al Yanamun. Open to those we've lost. Open to the one amongst you call Ricky Giftstone. We declare ourselves and our home open for you. What now? I heard Harriet whisper. The palpable excitement in the whispered response from Chris's direction was so gleeful I started to lose the tingling his taking charge voodoo man shtick had inspired. Now, Harriet, we light the candle. I heard squeaks and scrapes next to me, could feel the cold, moist air shifting as Chris stood. The table groaned under his weight while he leant forward, feeling around in the dark with an outreached arm for the corpse wax candle Dorothy's hands had constructed. For her part, Dorothy was still running through every prayer she knew, the rosaries in her hands click-clacking almost inaudibly in the pressing darkness. Harriet was whispering too as Chris fumbled. Soon, Ricky, she was saying to herself as the lighter Chris held scraped into life. Soon I can say sorry. I'll see you again and I can say sorry and you know how much I loved you and... Her words were cut off by screams. They weren't hers or mine, or Dorothy's, or even from Chris. Ours came shortly after. The first screams when the lighter spark caught the intricate wick of Dorothy's hair weren't screams of fear. They were barely even human, although we understood their meaning. We knew the emotion straight away. Every single one of the horrifying creatures that had been skulking around us in the dark was communicating the same feeling. Hatred. It only took two flickers of the flame and half a second of listening to those roars for all four of us to open our mouths and beg the new, godless, unfamiliar sky for deliverance from our monumental mistake. When the flame from Chris's lighter caught the candle, the light from the corpse wax, placenta, seed, and hair revealed just what the profane author of the Te'alim al Raju al Akir was trying to achieve when they left instructions for this... This, this manor at Auruya, or whatever Chris had said it was called. They hadn't found a way to communicate with worlds outside our own. They found a way to travel there. We weren't in our apartment.
The light from the Dorothy hair wig revealed that the four of us, along with the oak table and corpse wax manorat Alruya, were on a vast plateau of blue sand. The azure flat stretched far beyond any horizon, merging into the starless sky somewhere much further than my mortal eyes could see. The blue sands weren't empty though. I have never seen a place less empty in my life. There were countless trillions of them. They looked as though somebody had sculpted them from clay, someone who had heard a human being described but never seen one up close. Their skin was pure white, not white as in Caucasian or even the white of albinism, but the pure, untainted alabaster of boiled bone. Their features were crooked, skewed, asymmetrical. None had limbs of an even length, an appropriate number of fingers or joints that swung the way they should. There were some with three breasts, some with two belly buttons, some with nothing between their legs and others with what should be between their legs somewhere else entirely. Aside from a shrinking half-foot perimeter around our out-of-place oak table, the miles of azure sand under the featureless sky was filled by writhing, twisted imitations of human beings. Every inch of space between greasy, misshapen bodies was taken up by more greasy, misshapen bodies. They shuddered and wriggled over each other, clamoring and fighting to reach the frigid air above the putrid-smelling tide. The only thing worse than the forms in that encroaching mass of ivory flesh was their faces. Each set of features was just as damned as the body they belonged to. No sets of eyes sat parallel, no cleft or swollen lips not peeled back to reveal a jagged tooth snarl. No uniformity or reason existed in those trillion faces. Nothing could link them as belonging to creatures of the same kind beyond a single observation. The expression beneath every lumpy brow and around every crooked nose was the same. Pure, unfiltered, unrestrained hatred. Hatred directed through a near-infinite number of mismatched pairs of eyes at us. There was no way we could hear our screaming above the offending roars and high-pitched bestial howls of those things without number. The sheer volume of it shook the table and my bones. I saw the other three, though. Saw the unbridled terror and unchecked tears that let me know their blind panic was at least as overbearing as my own. Chris was still bent over the table the lighter still flaming under his white-knuckled thumb. Dorothy had jumped to her feet, holding out her rosaries at the tide and praying so fast I doubt I could have understood even if all I could hear was the rage pouring from more mouths than there were stars in the normal sky I knew. It was when I saw Harriet's face that I knew I had to leap onto the table and blow out the candle and stop the madness my well-meaning idiot had landed us in. She was looking at something. Something bearing down on Dorothy. I knew why she was. I recognized it too. Even though one of its eyes was thrice the size of the other. Even though its nose only had one nostril flapping loosely on its left side. Even though the mouth was fused shut and it stretched through an ear crudely sticking out of its cheek. Even without the farmer's tan. Without the bushy ginger eyebrows or afro or the warm smile which made me more jealous of Harry than I'd ever admit, I knew that face. So did she. She had one fleeting half-second to stare, eyes wide, as it got its mid-snatched paws around Dorothy's neck. Harriet's cry rang in my ears long after I snuffed out the candle and we plugged back into the blackness. Ricky! The three of us awoke at the same time. We were back in the apartment. The corpse wax candle. The manorat al Ruya, as Chris called it, was nothing but a melted heap of cooling fat and hair at the center of the wood. As for Chris, he immediately started vomiting. Harriet was curled up in the fetal position, her athletic frame juddering with silent sobs. As for Dorothy, well, the thing which meant Harriet would scream, it's not Ricky, it's not Ricky over and over in her sleep had just enough time to grab her and rip the rosaries from her shielding hands. The wooden bees rolling off the table and pinging on the hard warm tiles were all that remained. Chris and I didn't last long after that. Neither did my studies. It took about 30 minutes of my first residency shift after the incident to decide I needed a career change. I packed up and moved back to Wisconsin. I knit and sell sweaters now. 
I go to church. Not because I believe, but because my parents go, and if I don't go with them, I'm alone with my thoughts. My relationship with Chris and Harriet soured very quickly. I hadn't heard from them in years until a few days ago. I'd broken up with Chris and moved out of the apartment as soon as the police and Dorothy's Mormon boyfriend were satisfied we had nothing to do with her disappearance. I couldn't take the lying. Chris and Harriet could though, which I knew because they started their affair the same night we lit the manor at al -Ruya. I'd been in a restless sleep all of twenty minutes when they started tearing each other's clothes off in the room next door, apparently. I don't blame them. I'm not bitter. I was going to break up with Chris the following morning. It was one of the last resolutions I'd made before an uneasy sleep filled with the dreams of Azor plateaus took me. They tried to keep it hidden from me, which is why I decided it would be no heavy weight on my conscience to leave them together with the trauma in that damned apartment. I heard through the few former Florida friends who check in that Harriet and Chris are still together, still in the same apartment too. That's partly why I'm writing this out now. I got a letter yesterday, one sent from a location in Florida, judging by the return address. I'm going to go back there, to see Harriet and Chris again. The letter was just a simple sheet of paper with a message scrawled in Sharpie. There was no dear Bex, no signing off from Harriet or Chris but I knew instantly who it was from and that I couldn't say no. We're going to get Dorothy. You in? I'm flying out to Florida in the morning. A quick unblocking and messenger conversation with Chris has taught me all I need to know. That's why I'm writing to you now. Please, don't make the same mistakes we did. Never light a corpse wax candle. We did once. And I'm pretty sure when we do it again in a few days, nobody will be left to warn you.